All right, so we have reached our very last segment of the night. And to wrap things up, we're going to be talking about disruptive technology. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, it's like how the wheel that shook up those Flintstone cars that, no? OK, no, I'm actually <laughs> talking more like the cell phone, how that rocked the telecom sector in the 1990s, or MP3s, how that really shook things up in the music industry in the 2000s. We may actually be on the verge of a similar game-changing transformation with our nation's electrical grid. From what? That's right, everyone. From Kevin Larimore, Public Works Supervisor Remember at the City him? of Del Norte. No, that's a joke. <laughs> we're talking about solar power. But in order to fully understand what we're talking about and how it fits into Colorado's energy future, first we're going to need to take a step back into the past. We're going to learn about this building in a minute. But first, take it away, Mr. Souza. That's, yes, Jordan, you brought your greatest hits of the 1880s mixtape. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I've been more nervous about that high five than anything else tonight. We connected that. <laughs> we totally did. What we're hearing here, ladies and gentlemen, is the Marine Corps March. Semper Fidelis. That's right. And the reason we're playing Semper Fidelis is not only because it was a smash hit jam of the late 19th century. Which, which it totally was. But totally we're was. playing it because it was recorded at Edison Records. As in Thomas Edison, the heralded inventor of the phonograph. The movie camera. The electrographic vote counter. Yeah, crazy. The magnetic iron ore separator. And of course, the light bulb. And this is probably the understatement of the century, but Mr. Edison, he knew a thing or two about electricity. He even helped invent, he actually did invent electric power distribution. And the reason we are going back in time right now is because the conflict today around solar power in a way, it, it sort of already happened. And we're going to use some clips from the remarkable Rocky Mountain PBS program, Colorado Experience, to help tell this story. I think the whole episode was actually playing in the other room. In the 1890s, America was electrifying. But we hadn't settled on a standard for electrification. And really, there were two rival electrical systems that, that were trying to become the, the major system. Thomas Edison with his DC system versus George Westinghouse and his AC system. So Edison, he wanted a system of small power plants spread all over the place, delivering DC electricity to nearby homes and businesses. It was a decentralized, distributed model for generation. Whereas Westinghouse, he wanted large, centralized power plants sending high voltage electricity across a spider web of power lines connecting the entire country. And the battle between these two systems, it was actually decided right here. No, well, in Colorado. Close, in Colorado. In Colorado. Yeah. Getting to the gold mines outside Telluride, Colorado, was a nasty undertaking at this time. It was rugged. The roads where and if they even existed were treacherous. And probably the biggest challenge of all was supplying the mines with their enormous and incessant energy needs, hauling up coal in woods all the way up to the mines on tired little mule backs. Yeah, that, that stinks. <laughs> Uh, and this stumbling block, it was so major, it almost put the mines right out of business. That is until this guy came along, L.L. Nunn. He convinced George Westinghouse, who we heard about earlier, he convinced George Westinghouse to install a hydropower generator at nearby Trout Lake and then run his alternating current lines all the way up to the mines. It was the first real test of is. AC power and the first commercial AC power plant, which you see right here down in Telluride. It was an outrageous and unexpected success, and word traveled fast. So at that point, Edison, I think, was finally willing to, to recognize or acknowledge that the AC system was superior, and at that point, uh, the AC-DC conflict is, is said to have concluded. AC power was picked up all around the country. Power plants connected by that spider web of power lines that today we call the electric grid. 
But that battle between Edison and Westinghouse, even to this day, we are deeply impacted by the result of that battle in ways we probably would have never guessed in the 1890s. For example, this is more than half a century before the invention of the transistor. No? No? Okay, I'll tell you what it is. So it's that tiny little switch that makes every microchip, every computer work, and it actually needs DC power. It's not going to work without it. So all of our modern electronics, your cell phones, your computers, the only reason they work with our grid is because we've got tiny AC to DC adapters in our chargers. That's why you have those big squares yeah. on your computer chargers. So there are still some examples of DC power, but it's totally the underdog. And really, society has thought of that battle as being concluded between AC and DC. But it's really not. That battle is totally back. It's back. And that's largely thanks to solar panels and other forms of distributed generation. So let's take a look at the price of rooftop solar over time. The different colors are just different sized rooftop systems. And over the past 15 years, prices have dropped 60%. As a result, the number of new systems that people are installing each year, it's going up and up and up, which means the total number of solar panels connected and working right now, it's basically gone Pew. Kaboom! Like one of those rockets that John Mizia used to build. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's exactly like a rocket, the growth of solar. To put it another way, this is what neighborhoods might have looked like a few decades ago where you were a total dork Nerd. if you had solar panels. <laughs> but in the not-too-distant future, it might look like that. Yeah, you're going to get hazed with that one. I've got one. You, you have one? <laughs> you, uh, of course I have one. Of course okay. I have solar. <laughs> of course I do. And utilities, they're saying that this scenario, some utilities are saying this threatens that Westinghouse power system that we've built over the last 120 years, that we've built to be stable and reliable. Yeah, uh, solar panels on your roof, they're what some might call unreliable. Right? What happens on a cloudy day? Plus, most of them actually generate DC electricity that has to be switched back to AC to get into your home and then onto the grid. And when it does, it moves up the power lines in the opposite direction as the big central power plant electricity. This is a logistical it's headache crazy. for the utilities. And as a result, they've been fighting it. They've been working the room with lawmakers. They've been trying to hold this distributed rooftop solar back in whatever way they can to make it too expensive for customers. Still viewing this all in context, solar power is still a very small piece of the pie. Less than one quarter of 1% of US power is generated by solar. Still, there are analysts who say that solar is very quickly, if not already, reaching that price point where it will be a major game changer, just like cell phones were or just like MP3s were. I wake up every day oh. and... My bad. <laughs> <laughs> and those same analysts have been suggesting that utilities shouldn't be fighting this change, but they should be embracing it. And some people like the guy you just heard and will hear again, actually are. He's Kelsey Pegler Jr. He's the president of NRG Home Solar. There we go. I wake up every day and focus entirely on getting solar on homes across America. So NRG is a power company and they're operating all the way across the company, across the country from New Jersey to Wyoming. That's right. And they're not exactly a utility, but they operate in much the same way. So they have uh, big power plants that generate electricity that they sell to customers, but then they will also sell you a solar panel for your roof or they'll lease you one. A power company of choice. They have to compete with other power operators and a lot of other utilities don't. And that is one of the reasons that they say they need to stay ahead of the curve on this particular situation, distributed rooftop solar. By the time you recognize that technologies are disrupting, it's too late. So to figure out what this solar scuffle means for the future of our grid, Dan and I went out to a little place you might heard of, um, the National Renewable Electricity Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, and we spoke with Doug Aaron. A guy with a, a pretty long title. Executive Director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis. What that means, his job is basically to figure out how to make the energy future happen right now. And he spends his time thinking about how will the system evolve into a smarter, more resilient, more affordable system. 
And so his take on the disruption that's happening right now, thanks to solar panels and other forms of distributed generation, is that we will ultimately end up with a hodgepodge of electricity sources. So our grid isn't going to stay totally Westinghouse style, but it's not like it's going to flip over to Edison style overnight either. We're going to have a never before seen hybrid grid. I like to think of it as a Franken grid. Yeah. It's one that takes advantage of the opportunities where there's distributed energy and the benefits that we've so valued over the last decades, if not a century, uh, of the centralized system with transmission and distribution. And as Aaron explained to us, channeling the benefits of both this Edison and Westinghouse power system means accepting some new concepts, like... What you'd call islandable mini-grids. So oh, wait, 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 what? Islandable <laughs> mini-grids, small areas. Islandable mini-grids. So I've I- never... Islandable... <laughs> Mini grids. Mini grids. I had never heard of an yeah. islandable mini our grid new favorite word. at that time. <laughs> but so when we were talking earlier at the beginning of this entire program about how I said that the innovations that I thought were happening in Del Norte, Colorado, actually are happening in Colorado, you need look no further than Fort Carson Army Base which is one of several army bases around the country with their own solar-supported microgrids. So if the power goes out around Fort Carson, these solar panels actually will keep the power running. So in the near future, we'll still have the major capital G grid, but microgrids like this one at Fort Carson, they're probably going to become a lot more common. And also, I mean, we just look at the community of Boulder, for instance. I mean, they're trying to embark on creating their own isolated, entirely isolated grid and powering that 40% with renewables. And uh, remember those personal electronics, the ones that run off of DC power, the kind that we opted against in the 1890s? Uh, As I'm sure you know, that's a large and growing share of our energy use. So some people are actually proposing wiring up homes, businesses, buildings with DC grids inside the building. Some people are calling it Edison's revenge. (laughs) He's back. It's Edison. And we actually, (laughs) Jordan was doing research on this and found several news articles that actually that was the headline Edison at, at least two. And a couple and a couple of them <laughs> use the same picture of Edison kind of frumpily. The one that we, that we used, used earlier. Anyway, so this this new system, it's Edison Westinghouse again, but it's not Edison versus Westinghouse anymore. Now it's Edison and Westinghouse. Warm <laughs> and fuzzy. Yeah, so um <laughs> and you know, we're journalists, we're not psychics. So we don't know exactly how the story will end up ultimately, but we're telling you what we do now. So, and what we do know is that Colorado is at the center of a watershed moment for the future of energy and the next phase of energy in this country. And a lot of the innovations that you see, they might come out of this very building that we're standing in right now, the Powerhouse Energy Campus. And, you know, we as energy journalists, we're lucky enough that we get to cover it and we'll keep doing so. So do I get to play Semper Fidelis again? Yes! Yes, I do. All right. That means we're actually done.